I'm turning now to the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 1 and verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, these words, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though thy sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And our subject is our argument with God. This is a tremendous invitation to think, to consider. Come now. You could render it a little differently because the sense of the original, the Hebrew, gives us just a little more than comes through here. You could render it, come on now. Come on now, like maybe said to a team in some sporting activity, a word of urging and encouragement, not just the reasoning, come now, wake up, but more, come on. And that's what we need, an exhortation to wake up and to think. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Some say the idea is a law court. I'm not so sure it is, but it is a kind of personal debate. As God says, come and tell me what your problem is. What is your complaint about me? What is your complaint about walking with your God? What are your objections? What lies behind your unbelief, your separation from me? Tell me, lay out your case, and I will try to help you and answer you. And God, for his part, will lay out his. Come, let us reason together. I will tell you why I have made you and why you should turn to me and how much you need me and what I will do for you and how I will provide for you. So let us exchange our reasonings. That's the call. It appears down here in verse 18 as though in our way of doing things this might introduce the various arguments that God will advance. But most of them have already been made from the beginning of the chapter. It's a chapter of reasoning. And then comes this invitation. Come now, or come on now, in the light of all that I've said. God says, let's exchange views. Let us reason together. And so we look back to see examples of what the Lord's reasoning is from the beginning of the chapter. This is very remarkable. Come now, let us reason together. Just a minute. It is God who is the injured party in this breach between mankind and God. In this situation of unbelief and rejection of him and focusing on the here and now and material things and dismissing him and ignoring him and breaking his law. He is the injured party. He is the one who has been wronged. He is the one who has all the complaints against us. And yet, as if there's a cold war between us and God, he is the one who breaks the silence. He is the one who takes the initiative to restore a relationship. He is the one in amazing condescension and kindness who speaks to us. Come on now, let us reason together. He beckons and he calls. It's a tremendous situation. Why should God be so tolerant, so patient, so merciful? 
when we are so resistant to him, why should he come out to us or come down to us? And there is in this phrase, come now, a kind of wake-up call. You see this in the words of Christ, in the parable of the lost son, recorded in the Gospel of Luke and chapter 20. You see this very theme. There's the parable of the lost son, and he wants his share of his father's fortune right now, before the father is dead even. What an attitude. And he's bold enough to ask for it. Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me, even now. And in the parable, the father, who represents Almighty God, gives him his share of goods, gives him his liberty, gives him wealth to go and invest and spend. And he promptly takes it, you know the parable, and he goes into a far country, not a neighboring country, not a country neighboring that, but a far distant country. He crosses frontier after frontier to get as far away from his father's estate as he possibly can because he doesn't want his father to contact him, hear anything about him, and he certainly doesn't want any contact. The far country. And when in that far country he spends all his living, he wastes his substance with riotous living, it runs down and he's in poverty and he would even go and work keeping pigs and he would eat the husks that the swine did eat to survive. And there he is, and then the text, the parable says this, when he came to himself. And actually, you could simply translate it from the Greek New Testament, when he came to. That's all it says. When he came to. When he woke up. And he thought to himself, what am I doing here? When my father's servants let alone his sons, his servants, have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. He came to in the parable, saw what he'd done, saw the utter foolishness of what he'd done, and he made up his mind he would return to his father, and he would say, Father, I have sinned, and so on. And that's the case here. Come now, you're far away. If you've never sought God and you've never repented of your sin and you've never trusted in Christ, you're far away. And God says, come on now. Come and think. What are you doing with your life? Where is it going? What are you living for? What are your hopes and aspirations? just scratching what happiness you can out of the surface things of this material life. And if you're sick and you're at death's door or you're old and you're near the end, what's going to happen to you? What's the purpose of it all? If you're learned, what was all the learning for? Ultimately, eternally, how has it helped you? You have nothing with God. You don't obey him. You don't seek him. You don't inquire about him. You don't want to know him. You don't expect anything from him. You don't pray to him. You don't receive any help in your life or any guidance. You don't know anything about forgiveness. You don't know anything about your soul being given life by God and having communion with him. You know nothing about God's plans and your place in them. You have nothing but this narrow, narrow material life. And yet you think you're free. 
and you have everything you want and you can do without him. Come on now, says the Lord. Let us reason together. Let us think, what's your state? What's your condition? Where are you? Look at some of these verses, right from the beginning. Verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. God has nourished and brought up children. The primary meaning is Israel of old, the uh, nation that was especially favoured. But it applies to all of us. Who are we? We're human beings. Higher than the animals. God's special creation. So much higher than the animals. Made for a purpose. So vastly different with the power of reason. With a moral consciousness with an instinct for God and eternity, with the power of language and communication, with highly tuned emotional systems that think and feel, so many unique and special gifts were created somewhat in the very image of God. Of course, nothing like him in one sense, and yet resembling him remarkably in some of the gifts that he's given to us. I have given rise to children, says God, and made them special for a purpose, for worship, to be my people, to seek me and know me and love me, and to enjoy me now and eternally. Verse 3. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel, in fact all human beings, doth not know. My people doth not consider. Look at the examples. An ox, a beast, a brute, if you like, has more sense than we have. The ox knoweth his owner and serves him. And the ass, universally acknowledged to be a stupid animal, the ass, senseless, knows his master's crib. For crib there, think manger, think feeding trough. That's the idea behind the word. The ass knows where his provisions are, where it's provided for, and turns to that place. And we don't know. Our provisions come from God, our forgiveness, our spiritual life, our joy and peace, our eternity, our strength for life, our guidance, our understanding of what life is for and human nature and everything, all comes from God, and we don't know it with less sense than the ass. That's God's reasoning. Come now, come on. Let's reason together. Human beings are more foolish than br brute beasts. Ah, verse 4, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord and provoked the Holy One unto anger. They are gone away backwards on the run from Almighty God. That's a description of us. Foolish people, they live for pride and for acquisitiveness or covetousness or simply put greed. They live lives full of so much hate and selfishness and lies 
Every man, every woman, a liar in the making of excuses, in exaggerating their exploits and abilities. See those television chat shows? What are they but strings of invented stories for the gullible to make the tellers look big and special and wonderful? What's life? Yes, capable of good things, some deeds of kindness, some honourable and noble things, but so much sin, exploitation, and so many horrors on every hand, laid as God sees us, we're laden with these things. And he will give us no blessing, there will be no help for us. Oh, but if we could be washed, if we could be forgiven by the Lord, if we could have an operation of God in our lives to make us new so that we could have some mastery over our sin, whereas now we have almost none. If only we could be changed. That's what the Christian life is about. Constantly we hear people's accounts of what happened to them when they sought the forgiveness of the Lord when they were converted to him. Oh, there are so many of these accounts in this church. People who come to join the church, they tell us first of all, or write it down for us, how God brought them to himself. And you see wonderful things. I see all the testimonies of people who apply from around the world in this country to follow the seminary course. And the first thing they do in their applications is tell us how they came to know the Lord. And you read a, a man here in such and such a place, and he was an addict and a drunkard and a wife beater and a terrible individual. What happened to him? Well, God dealt with him. And he heard about the grace of God, and he was cut to the core. And he was brought under deep awareness of his sinful state and his lost condition before God. And he cried out to him and believed in Christ and yielded his life to him. And he was changed some years, perhaps, since that happened. And his life has proved it. He's been altogether different. We go right back to the Bible. We see it with the Apostle Paul, a most unpleasant man, and I think a very haughty man, and a man who thought that his career as a chief among the Jews would be greatly enhanced if he became the principal persecutor of Christians. So he sought the letters of authority and he went about hunting down humble believers in Christ, Christians, and arranging for them to be hauled off in captivity to prison and even tried and perhaps even executed and certainly imprisoned and ordered to forfeit all their goods. Time after time, he's called by one playwright a black beetle of a man. And he probably was. And then God dealt with him. And he was humbled. And he was struck down by the hand of God in a very physical way. You know, on the Damascus Road. And he came to Christ. And he wept tears of repentance. And sorrowed for all his sin and trusted in Christ alone to take away the punishment and to make him new. And he did. And right from his conversion, God said to him, you are a chosen vessel to bear my name around the world as it was then, with much persecution and trouble and ultimately death. You will have to suffer, but you will be an apostle and a preacher, a proclaimer, of the gospel of salvation and forgiveness. 
And he did, willingly. And he went about suffering often, privation, hardship, difficulty, and he was used of God in the great mission to the Gentiles. And so many churches were founded, so many people converted, blessing and praising God for their new life. God brought their souls to life, brought them into communion with himself. They had their sins forgiven, and their character changed, and their minds emancipated so that they could understand the word of God and spiritual things and the plans of God. God did so much and does so much for every single convert. Come on now, says the Lord. What are the reasons for your unbelief? Do you think sin is better than holiness? Do you think to be gradually taken over entirely by the tentacles of sin so that you become perhaps more embittered, more cynical, more hardened, more obdurate, more inclined to lies and to cheating and to selfish acts? Do you think that's better? than for God to help you and bless you and work with you and change you and bring you understanding and peace and happiness and set you on that certain road to eternal life? What's your reason for recoiling from God and hating him and resisting him? Come on now, says God. Tell me and I'll answer you. I'll show you how much better it is, how much more wonderful. No more a life wasted and ended with pain and judgment and everlasting punishment, but a life with the Lord of happiness and peace and knowledge and growing depths. Why, dear friends, this is the reasoning in this passage. Verse 5, why should ye be stricken any more? Will ye revolt more and more? The whole head is sick. Your reasoning faculty, your mind, is being increasingly conditioned and shaped by this present age, by this passing world. This world lurches from secular, one secular ideology or or way of thinking to another. Currently, we're in the me-me phase of human life. What I want, what I think, what I can achieve, what I... Do you want your mind to be completely conditioned by this world? so that you think only for number one, only for yourself. And if you're 30% like that now, in five years' time you'll be 50, 60% like that. In 10 years, 20 years' time, you'll be 90% like that. You'll be conditioned. Your whole head is sick. Your way of thinking, your hopes, your aspirations, and the whole heart faints. Your affections, your feeling system, your emotions, your capacity to love is becoming progressively distorted by the society, the unbelieving, the godless society in which you live so that more and more you love the things that Satan wants you to love, that the enemy of your soul wants you to love. You go down and down in your tastes, in your feelings and your desires until the lusts dominate. It sounds horrific, but this is why God says, come, come on now. Let's reason together. 
be washed, be delivered, be forgiven, be changed by God, be made new, receive spiritual life, come to know him, come to walk with him, come to understand, come to see, come to love him, come to prove him day by day, have something, everything, which can never be taken away from you, a walk with God, a new heart, and a heavenly destiny. This is the reasoning of God with each one of us. Oh, friends, I come back down to this 18th verse as I move to conclusion. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, there were certain places in the ancient world where dyes were speciality. In Tyre, of Tyre and Sidon fame, was a focus of the dyeing industry, the dyeing of cloths. The most vermilion, scarlet cloths could be obtained from there. The dye was made from insects. The cloth would be dyed and dried, and then it would be dyed again, and then again, and then again. It was an over-the-top process. Garments, the expensive things, material, could be dyed up to eight or nine times, and by their processes rendered color fast. It would last for years. It would dazzle the eye. It was a deep, deep, deeply impregnated color. This is the illustration of Isaiah. Though your sins be as scarlet, red like crimson, of course, they won't necessarily be scarlet and crimson to the people you work with. Sometimes not even to your family. Sometimes those scarlet sins are secret sins, secret lusts, secret horrors within you. We put on a, a good show, but to God, they're scarlet. To God, they're terrible beyond words. Every selfish, lying, mean, hateful thought and act, sins of omission, things we should do that we don't do, things of commission, things we do that we shouldn't do, sins of constitution, that is to say the sin is so ingrained in us that it becomes us. You say of some people, not he told a lie, but he is a liar. It's become a constitutional sin. Do you have constitutional selfishness? Do you have constitutional sins? Sins against God? I haven't loved him. I haven't worshipped him. I haven't obeyed him. I haven't desired him, I haven't honoured him in any way or learned from him. But I've broken his laws and I've trashed them and ignored them and I've trodden down the voice of conscience, sins against God, sins against fellow human beings. I don't have to explain that. Thousands and thousands of sins. August, in, August top, Montague Top Lady, the hymn writer, wrote the hymn Rock of Ages. When he wrote that hymn, he first published it in 1736. He had a magazine called the Gospel Magazine. 
He wrote an article on the national debt, if you please. The article discussed the national debt, which even in those days was so great it couldn't be paid. We don't talk about it today. And he estimated, or somebody had and he reproduced this, that if the national debt were to be paid in 1736 in the most available currency, but there was not enough of it of that day, which was a sovereign, then it would take so many sovereigns, it would fill horses and carts in a continuous line from Land's End to John O'Groats. And there wasn't that much coinage. And there weren't that many horses and carts. The whole thing is impossible. The debt is unpayable. It's far too great. And on the end of this article, he wrote, words to this effect, it's the same with our sin. If you sin once every five minutes, that's a very reasonable assumption when you consider the state of sin and all the different kinds of sin that are odious before God. And you think you've got 12 to 14 hours in your waking day, you've got more than that. And you multiply that by the number of days in the week and the number of weeks in the year. When you get to 70 years of age, let alone 80, the number is vast. I've forgotten what it is, but it is vast, unpayable. There the article ends, and he publishes a poem. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. And he pictures Calvary's cross like the rock at Horeb. Christ died for sinners, and I depend upon him, and the cleansing that can come only from him. How else can you have your sins forgiven? How do you think you can have sins forgiven? By your merit? By your works? Get up at five o'clock in the morning every day of your life from now until you're de dead to do a good deed. It would be nothing like enough to counterbalance all your sin. It would be only a drop in the ocean. Our works cannot balance out our sin. Oh, look for some religious ceremony that you could carry out. Go to Mass with the Catholics. They can't help you. Do something religious. Does God love ceremonies? Will he take them instead of looking at your sin? Of course not. There's no ceremony. But if I engage in intensive contemplation, like the Beatles did years and years ago, or tried to do, will that give me a new life and take away my sin? Of course not. No technique worked by any human being can wash away sin. There is only one act can possibly wash away sin, and that is God coming himself, becoming incarnate, being born in Bethlehem, growing up a man, a perfect man, God and man, and allowing himself to go to Calvary's cross, to be crucified, to be slain. And God the Father would put upon him all the punishment due to those who would be saved, to those who would be forgiven. 
in the history of the world and he would bear it instead of them. The substitutionary atoning death of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. That's the only way to be washed free from all our sin. Verse 16, wash you, make you clean. And the only way to wash is to come to Christ. And whether you cry or whether your eyes are dry, you cry in your heart and you weep in your heart, Lord, I am a sinner. I am an evil man and woman. I cannot set foot in heaven. I cannot be accepted by thee, the living God. But I believe the gospel and I trust in Christ and I believe he died for every sinner who ever came to him in repentance and faith. And I rest my soul on him and what he has done. And if you mean that with all your heart, God will transform you. God will come to you. Christ will embrace you. You will be a child of God. You will know him and prove him. And you'll be on the pathway to heaven. Dear friends, hear these things. Come on now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. <laughs>